Hello. So, today we're supposed to have uh, Arizona waiting me to. Today I'm supposed to have company. So I'm going to read um, one story. And by the time I get done reading this story, I think we'll have a young lady who volunteered to read also. It's going to join us and read another story or two. Um, you remember I asked you guys who would want to read some stories and many of you said yes and then you chickened out. Oh, well, we have a non-chicken this evening and I'm waiting to see if she's going to come on before I miss that. I don't know my Lord, I joke, I don't that. But a young lady um, volunteered to read stories. So I'm going to start off with something from one of my favorite books. You know this one? 37 Utterly Silly Stories. And this story is called The Remarkable Rocket. I'm reading... I do this every evening. Well, it's a like as we never do it yesterday. That was incorrect. I started out doing this Monday to Thursday, but sometimes I'm unable. At 7.30 in the evening, it's bedtime stories for kids. And the intention is to encourage parents and caregivers to read stories to the children. Read to them, speak with them, bond with them, and give them a creative safe space for them, a comfort zone. Somewhere where they can feel like they can actually interact with you. It's about encouraging um, encouraging bonding and um, a whole lot more stuff. But let me just get into the story. I will tell you after. All right. So, and Karen Campbell, if you think it's such a nice idea and you want to come and read sometimes in the evening with me, please do so. As I said, as, as I said earlier, a young lady is going to join me in a little while. So the first story, The Remarkable Rocket, and this is by Oscar Wilde. And it's from the 37 Utterly Silly Stories. The king's son was going to be married, so there was great rejoicing. He had waited a whole year for his bride, and at last she had arrived. She was a Russian princess and had driven all the way from Finland in a sledge drawn by six reindeer. The sledge was shaped like a great golden swan. And between the swan's wings lay the princess herself. Her long ermine cloak reached down to her feet. On her head was a tiny silver cap. And she was as pale as the snow palace in which she had always lived. As she drove through the streets, all the people threw down flowers on her from the balconies. At the gate of the castle, the prince was waiting to receive her. When he saw her, he sank upon one knee and kissed her hand. Your picture was beautiful, he murmured. But you are more beautiful than your picture. The princess blushed. When the day for the marriage arrived, it was a magnificent ceremony. The bride and bridegroom walked hand in hand under a canopy of purple velvet embroidered with little pearls. Then there was a state banquet which lasted for five hours. The prince and princess sat at the top of the great hall and drank out of a cup of clear crystal. After the banquet, there was a ball. The bride and bridegroom were to dance the rose dance together, and the king played the flute. He played very badly, but no one dared to tell him so because he was the king. Indeed, everybody cried out, charming, charming. The last item on the program was a grand display of fireworks to be let off exactly at midnight. The little princess had never seen a firework in her life and was most excited. At the end of the king's garden, a great stand had been set up. As soon as everything had been put in its proper place, the fireworks began to talk to each other. The world is certainly very beautiful, cried a little squib. Just look at those yellow tulips. Why, if they have real crackers, they would not be lovelier. I am glad I have traveled. Travel improves the mind wonderfully. The king's garden is not the world, you foolish squib, said a big Roman candle. The world is an enormous place and it would take you three days to see it all. Any place you love is the world to you, said a thoughtful Catherine Wheel. Suddenly, a sharp, dry cough was heard and they all looked around. It came from a tall, haughty-looking rocket who was tied to the end of a long stick. <clears throat> he said again. Then he spoke in a very distinguished manner. How fortunate it is for the king's son, he remarked, that he is to be married on the very day on which I am to be let off. Really? 
if it had been arranged beforehand, it could not have turned out any better for him. But princes are always lucky. Dear me, said the little squib, I thought it was quite the other way, and that we were to be let off in a prince's honor. It may be so with you, he answered. Indeed, I have no doubt that it is. But with me, it is different. I am a very remarkable rocket and come from and come of remarkable parents. My mother was the most celebrated Catherine Wheel of her day and was renowned for her graceful dancing. When she made her great public appearance, she spun round 19 times before she went out. And each time that she did so, she threw into the air seven pink stars. She was three feet and a half across and made of the very best gunpowder. My father was a rocket like myself, continued the rocket. And from French grandparents. Oh, this is the same guy. The wrong voice. <laughs> My father, and you know what? Forget. He flew so high that the people were afraid that he would never come down again. He did though. And he made a most brilliant descent, descent into a shower of golden rain. The newspapers wrote about his performance in very flattering terms. The court gazette called him a triumph. A cracker nearly exploded with laughter. Pray, what are you laughing at? inquired the rocket. I am not laughing. I am laughing because I am happy, replied the cracker. That is a very selfish reason, said the rocket angrily. What right have you to be happy? You should be thinking about others. In fact, you should be thinking about me. I am always thinking about myself and I expect everybody else to do the same. Suppose, for instance, anything happened to me tonight. What a misfortune that would be for everyone. The prince and princess would never be happy again. Their whole married life would be spoiled. And as for the king, I know he would never get over it. Really, when I begin to think about the importance of my position, I'm almost moved to tears. If you want to give pleasure to others, cried the Roman candle, you had better keep yourself dry. Certainly, exclaimed the Bengal light. That is only common sense. Common sense indeed, said the rocket indignantly. You forget that I am very uncommon and very remarkable. Besides, none of you have any hearts. Here you are laughing and making merry, just as if the prince and princess had not just been married. Well, really, exclaimed a small fire balloon. Why not? It is a most joyful occasion. And when I soar up into the air, I intend to tell the stars all about it. You will see them twinkle when I talk to them about the pretty bride. Ah, what a simple view of life, said the rocket. But it is only what I expected. There is nothing in you. You are hollow and empty. Why, perhaps the prince and princess may go to live in a country where there is a deep river. And perhaps they may have only one son, a little fair-haired boy with violet eyes like the prince himself. And perhaps someday he may go out to walk with his nurse. And perhaps the nurse may go to sleep under a great elder tree. And perhaps the little boy may fall into a deep river and be drowned. What a terrible misfortune. Poor people, to lose their only son. It is really too dreadful. I shall never get over it. But they have not lost their only son, said the Roman candle. No misfortune has happened to them at all. I never said that they had, replied the rocket. I said that they might. If they had lost their only son, there would be no use in saying anything more about the matter. I hate people who cry over spilled milk, but when I think that they might lose their only son, I certainly am very much affected. You certainly are, cried the Bengal light. In fact, you are the most affected person I ever met. You are the rudest person I ever met, said the rocket, quite offended, and you cannot understand my friendship for the prince. You had really better, better keep yourself dry, said the fire balloon. That is the important thing. Very important for you, I have no doubt, answered the rocket. But I shall weep if I choose. And he actually burst into real tears which flowed down his thick, like, his thick, like raindrops. They nearly drowned two little beetles who were just thinking of set setting up house together. And were looking for a nice dry spot to live in. Then the moon rose like a silver shield and the stars began to shine and a sound of music came from the palace. The prince and princess were leading the dance. They danced so beautifully that the tall white lilies peeped in at the window and watched them. And the great red poppies nodded their heads and beat time. Then 10 o'clock struck and then 11 and then 12. And at the last stroke of midnight, everyone came out on the terrace. 
Let the fireworks begin, said the king. And the royal officer of fireworks made a low bow and marched down to the end of the garden. He had six attendants with him, each of whom carried a lighted torch, a lit torch at the end of a long pole. It was certainly a magnificent display. Whiz, whiz, went the Catherine wheel as she spun round and round. Boom, boom, went the Roman candle. Then the squibs danced all over the place and the Bengal lights made everything look scarlet. Goodbye, cried the fire balloon as he soared away, dropping tiny blue sparks. Bang, bang, answered the crackers, who were enjoying themselves immensely. Everyone was a great success, except the remarkable rocket. He was so damp with crying that he could not go off at all. The best thing in him was the gunpowder, and that was so wet that te with tears that it was of no use. All his poor relations, to whom he would never speak, except with a sneer, shot up into the sky like wonderful golden flowers with blossoms of fire. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the court, and the little princess laughed with pleasure. I suppose they are reserving me for some grand occasion, said the rocket. No doubt. That is what it means. And he looked more hearty than ever as the ball finished. The next day, the workmen came to put everything tidy. This is evidently a welcome party sent for me, said the rocket to himself. I will receive them with suitable dignity. So he put his nose in the air and began to frown severely, as if he were thinking about some very important subject. But they took no notice of him at all till they were just going away. Then one of them caught sight of him. Hello, he cried. What a bad rocket. And he threw him over the wall into the ditch. Bad rocket? Bad rocket? Said the rocket as he whirled through the air. Impossible. Grand rocket. That is what the man said. Bad and grand sound very much the same. Indeed, they often are the same. And he fell into the mud. It is not comfortable here, he remarked. But no doubt it is some fashionable health spa and they have sent me to improve my health. My nerves are certainly very much shattered and I need rest. After some time, a large white duck swam by. She had yellow legs and webbed feet and was considered a great beauty on account of her waddle. Quack, 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 she said. What a curious shape you are. Were you born like that or is it the result of an accident? It is quite evident that you have always lived in the country, answered the rocket. Otherwise, you would know who I am. However, I will excuse your ignorance. It would be unfair to expect other people to be as remarkable as oneself. You will no doubt be surprised to hear that I can fly up into the sky and come down in a shower of gold and rain. I don't think much of that, said the duck, as I cannot see what use it is to anyone. Now, if you could plow the fields like, a, like the ox, or draw a cart like the horse, or look after the sheep like the collie dog, that would be something. My good creature, cried the rocket in a very hearty tone of voice. A person of my position is never useful. We have certain beauties and that is more than enough. Well, well, said the dog who was of a very peaceable disposition and never quarreled with anyone. Everybody has different tastes. I hope at any rate that you are going to live here. Oh, dear no, cried the rocket. I am merely a visitor, a distinguished visitor. The fact is that I find this place rather dull. I shall probably go back to court, for I know that I am destined to make a sensation in the world. I am made to be famous, said the rocket, and so are all my relations, even the humblest of them. Whenever we appear, we excite great attention. I have not actually appeared myself, but when I do so, it will be a magnificent sight. Ah, the higher things of life, how fine they are, said the duck. And that reminds me how hungry I, hungry I feel. And she swam away down the stream saying, quack, quack, quack. Come back, come back, screamed the rocket. I have a great deal to say to you. But the duck paid no attention to him. He sank a little deeper and still into the mud. When suddenly two little boys in white smocks came running down the bank with a kettle and a bundle of sticks for making a fire. Hello, cried one of the boys. Look at this old stick. I wonder how it came here. And he picked the rocket out of the ditch. Old stick, said the rocket indignantly. Impossible. Gold stick, that is what he said. Gold stick is very complimentary. 
Let us put it into the fire, said the other boy. It, would, it will help to boil the kettle. So they piled the sticks together, put the rocket on top and lit the fire. This is magnificent, cried the rocket. They're going to let me off in broad daylight so that everyone can see me. We will go to sleep now, the boy said. And when we wake up, the kettle will be boiled. So they lay down on the grass and shut their eyes. The rocket was very damp, so it took a long time to burn. At last, however, the fire caught him. Now I'm going off, he cried, and he made himself very stiff and straight. I know I shall go much higher than the stars, much higher than the moon, much higher than the sun. In fact, I shall go so high that fizz, 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 and he went straight up into the air. Delightful, he cried. I shall go on like this forever. What a success I am. But nobody saw him. Then he began to feel a curious tingling sensation all over him. Now I'm going to explode, he cried. I shall set the whole world on fire and make such a noise that nobody will talk about anything else for a year. Bang, 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 went the gunpowder. There was no doubt about it, but nobody heard him. Not even the two little boys, for they were sound asleep. Then all that was left of him was the stick. And this fell down on the back of a goose who was walking by the ditch. Good heavens, cried the goose. It is raining sticks. And she went into the water. I knew I should create a big sensation, gasped the rocket, and he went out. And that's the story of the remarkable rocket. I think I've met this fellow quite a few times in real life. The most self-important character who doesn't really serve any real purpose. This story was The Remarkable Rocket by Oscar Wilde and taken from 37 Utterly Silly Stories. This wasn't a silly story at all. I feel like this story um, summarizes life quite um, efficiently. We know enough people like this, don't we? We all do. A lot of people who... You don't even want to give them a plate of rice because they will make that into a mountain of something else. The, some people who just can't handle success, can't even handle the idea of success. Um, some people who have no idea of how to just be and be humble. Um, humility is not something that everybody actually... Um, practices. We're all born humble, but some people depart from it. And this was the story of the remarkable rocket that turned out to be nothing at all. And let me see if my my good friend has no has not joined us yet. I will continue until she gets here. If she does get here. Um I think she's two hours behind me and said she would be in a few minutes after I started. So, we will go on to another story. I didn't pick a second story because I didn't think I would be needing it. But if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. How many times have we heard that cliche? So let me go back into the treasury of Aesop's fables and see what I have not read yet. The eagle and the man. The eagle and the man. 151, the eagle and the man. Alrighty. So this is the eagle and the man taken from the treasure of Aesop's fables. And if you grew up in Jamaica, you, you if you grew up in Jamaica and went to school, especially primary school, any time up to the nineties, you should definitely know the treasure. Of, the, the, uh, you should know Aesop's fables. I'm not sure what happened after that. And I don't know about anywhere else. 
But this story, the eagle and the man, goes like this. Once an eagle was caught in a net. Poor eagle. He flapped his great wings and tore at the net with his beak. But it was no good. The net was too strong and he could not free himself. The eagle knew that if he could not get free from the net, he would die. Just then, a man saw the eagle in the net. What a beautiful creature, he said, the king of the birds. But then he saw that the eagle was caught in a net and the man knew what he had to do. He climbed up to the great bird and set it free. So the man saved the eagle's life. The grateful eagle flew off. The eagle decided that he would repay the man's kindness if he could. One day the man went to sleep near a very old wall. The eagle saw him lying in the shade and his sharp eyes told him that the crumbling wall was so old that it might fall down at any minute. There was no time to lose. The man was fast asleep so the eagle flew down and snatched his hat away. He took it in his talons and with a flapping of his great wings he flew away. The man looked up and saw what had happened. Give it back, the man shouted. That's my hat. He ran after the eagle. He ran fast, but the eagle flew even faster. The man recognized the eagle as the one he had saved, but he could not think why he would have stolen the hat. After a while, the eagle dropped the hat and flew away. The man picked up the hat and saw that it was not damaged. The man went back to the wall. He was still puzzled about why the eagle had taken his hat, but he wanted to finish his sleep. But when he got back, the man was amazed to find that the old wall had fallen down. It would certainly have killed him, so the eagle had saved the man's life. The man looked up and saw the great bird circling in the sky. Thank you, my friend, he called to the eagle. That's the story of the man and the eagle. One of Aesop's fables, taken from this treasure of Aesop's fables, as retold and illustrated by Val Biro. Those are my two stories for the night, and I'm still not joined by my friend. So, there's not very much to discuss about the second story because it was very obvious, and I don't think there was any, mo any moral of significance to it. But the first story was full of gems, and I don't think... It it bears much discussion either, except we could say we know that person and we've seen them a million times. And they're on, I, I think I just posted something that I saw shared somewhere and it turned out to be a skit, but it's a skit that hits very close to home because so many people have this sense of entitlement and this um, aggrandized idea of themselves. Like, People really are delusional these days. And it's, 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 I used to find it scary. I don't find it scary anymore. I'm kind of, I don't think I have much of an opinion on it. Like I'm, I'm very surprised when I see stuff like that. Like people, like the influencer in the restaurant saying, um, I shouldn't get a bill because I shared a story about the place that I'm making you famous. Like sharing a story on social media does not buy stock for anybody's restaurant. Now that turned out to be a skit, but people are that delusional. Uh, as a few people shared under the post to say that um, people are coming into their places and and ordering products and expecting not to pay for it because they're famous. It's like, <laughs> if you are that famous, then pay for the shit. Then can't you at least have enough money to buy what you need if you're that famous? Uh, what's the point of being famous if you can't pay for the stuff that you're going to consume? What would be the point of being of of claiming to be famous and bragging about it if you can't even afford your own life? How does that make sense? And and who cares that you're 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 on social media with a lot of followers and likes? Who cares? At the end of the day, everybody still have their bills to pay. So if you consume somebody's product, you still have to pay for it. And this sounds like the little remarkable rocket from, from um, Oscar Wilde's story. Um, so so self-important. Um, honestly, every single human alive or dead is just living. I mean, every human who has ever walked this planet just came here to live. That's it. If you're dead, obviously, you're no longer living. But... No matter how much importance you, you attach to what you do or the position you occupy, 
the fact still remains that we're all here for the same thing. We live and then we die. We live and then we die. Um, famous is relative. Uh, if somebody is world famous and, and there's somebody living somewhere in the world who doesn't know them, they're not famous to that person at all. Famous is relative to what you give attention to becomes famous for you. That that really is it. And even if somebody is famous and you are aware of their existence, it doesn't in any way obligate you to do anything with or for them. It doesn't. And it doesn't entitle them to anything from you. The fact that somebody is famous means nothing in the big picture. And at the end of the day, regardless of what, whether you get popular doing what you do or you don't get popular doing what you do, the fact is we're all just here trying to survive. You work so you can feed your family and yourself. And if you can manage to go above that and, and afford some creature comforts, then it's even better. But comfort is comfort. And there is no degree to comfort. To be honest with you, if you are comfortable, there's, there, there's no more comfortable. You either are comfortable or you're not. And, and of course, some of you will probably try to debate that and I really could care less, couldn't care less. If you're comfortable, you're comfortable. And somebody could be comfortable sitting on the ground. And somebody could be comfortable sitting in a mansion. Somebody could be comfortable sitting on the ground outside with nothing. Somebody else could be comfortable and they would both be experiencing the same thing because comfort is just that, comfort. If you have decided to be comfortable with what you have, you're no less comfortable than the other person who has a lot. And this is something that takes, it, some people, it takes a lot of people their entire life to learn it. Some people live and die and never learn it. Some people grow to a ripe old age and still don't learn it. It's, it's weird. And, and when people feel like they have nothing, yes, comfort is a choice, is a decision. And when people feel like they have nothing, um, when people have decided that they don't have anything, which is always a lie, everybody has things, um, then they say, you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't understand. Because you have stuff. But the reality is that the more they acquire, the more they will learn that it means absolutely fucking nothing. Um, you either decide to be comfortable or not. And there are people with everything in this world who are uncomfortable. It means nothing to them. Because comfort is not a particular target. Comfort is a state of mind. There are people who are comfort with, comfortable with extreme circumstances. And then there are some who, no matter what you give them, they'll never be. So, my little friend, the remarkable rocket spent his entire existence um, assuming a different identity than the one he had. Nothing about him was good enough for him. For me, that I'd, I'd, I'd like to think of that as um, not self-hate, but kind of like a, a low self-esteem. I would say low self-esteem because what he is, isn't enough it doesn't impress him so he has to pretend to be something else from in in my mind i would say that is an inferiority complex or low self-esteem i don't know maybe we know that i disagree with me, but me, me maintain that though you have to really think lowly of yourself for pretend for be something else you have to not like yourself oh thank you <laughs> yeah you have to not like yourself to, to need, to so badly need to be something else that you would pretend, even when everybody else can see you and everybody else can see what you are and you pretend to be something else. That, to me, is delusional. That is delusional. So, anyways, I have read two stories and I waited for my friend to arrive and she has not. So... Um, but I would really like us to go live just to see. Are you this come? I would like us to do the live thing even once just to say, hey, we're going to read stories together. Yeah, but no self-worth or low self-worth, yes. 
Um, I don't think there's any, you know, like people, people criticize the things that, the, the new trends of uh, body augmentation. And if I look at it, if I look at it um, from my personal perspective and how I feel about it and would I do any of that, there are some things that I would never, ever, ever, ever do. But if I look at it generally and, and um, without bias, as far as not my personal preference, no, and not whether or not I would do it, but what do I think of somebody else? Then I don't really ever care. Um, I feel like you have the right to do whatever you want to do to yourself. If I think it is something that will damage you and we're close enough for me to feel comfortable enough to speak to you about something so intimate, then I might say, hey, probably you want to look into that a little more. But I'm not going to come give you, you know, like some people just walk up to a random stranger like, oh, no, do to me and say, I don't like this. Like, who gives a fuck? I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of investment in other people's lives. And I don't think that you have to have low self-esteem to do body augmentation. I don't think so. Um, it's not like you're pretending to be something else. You're changing something about you, which if it is if it isn't um something that's going to hurt you in the long run or in the short run, then I can't think that it's different than changing a habit. Technically, it's no different. It, it, if you if you if you were fat and you decided that you didn't want to be fat anymore and you went to the gym and you started working out and you changed your diet and you changed your mindset and you had a different you ended up with a different look. Um I can't see how that's different than if you went to a surgeon and they brought you to that body same is same result. Um, one of them might be healthier than one, but at the end of the day, your health isn't going to affect my health. So I don't have any investment in that. I don't care. I really don't care. I can, I can like or not like what I see when you're done, but that again is really personal and private to me. So what you do is not any of my business. So that I have an opinion on it is kind of past my place, you know, but when you when you start pretending to be something else is different from when you start making yourself into something else so when you, the remarkable rocket kept saying it was more important and the prince needed him and you know everything was timed around him and centered him. he's the center of the universe to me that is low self-esteem and if anybody has any argument that would um, render that that point um, obsolete or incorrect, then share it with me because I would like to hear another opinion. I, I would like to learn, but it really does smack of um, self-hate. Uh, I, I can't, I feel comfortable in my skin. I really do feel comfortable in my skin. There are things that I would change and things that I do change from time to time. Like now that I'm getting older, um, I'm more open to the idea of taking better care of my health. Um, and especially since I plan to have children again, and I have to take better care of my health so that I can actually be there for them. Um, if that doesn't happen, then I don't really need to take that much care of my health because I don't, I don't care about me. But some things I, I feel like I would, I would change like I'm I'm looking for the best version of me at all times but I don't really feel like I would the, the best version of me is about how I look I don't I don't think so I think the best version